It's Monday the 27th of August 2018. Good morning and welcome to NTV Today. I'm Olive Burrows and plenty to cover on the show today as schools reopen. The third term of the school year has started with a cloud of uncertainty over a NAT strike. NAT Secretary General Wilson Sosion has spoken to NTV this morning and said they are not issuing any statement today. We will also look at some of the biggest stories of the week and bring in our panel to give context to the headlines. We also have our reporters around the country covering the latest news for us. We are live at the Anniversary Towers where IEBC Commissioners Consolatan Kathamaina and Margaret Mwachanya are presently waiting on the chairman Wafula Chebukati who has told them there is no space for them. They first turned up at the commission's headquarters on Friday. Brian Otoa from our sports desk will also bring us the latest from Parliament where the sports PS Kirimika Biria responds to audit queries raised over expenditure for the IAAF Under-18 World Youth Championship held in Nairobi last year. Bernardo Juang is in Migori County and will be joining us later with what the youth in the area are doing as the ele election date draws near. Well, as we mentioned a bit earlier, the commissioners Margaret Mwachanya and Consolata Nkatha Minor, uh, who are the two of the three independent electoral and boundaries commissioners who resigned in April this year, are presently at the Anniversary Towers. The Anniversary Towers being the seat of the IEBC. Mwachanya, who has spoken to NTV's Salim Swale, says they're presently waiting to see the chairman Mwafula Chebukati. We are live from that location, but here is what the IEBC chairman Mwafula Chebukati had to say on their intention to return to their posts. We begin with the live pictures. As you can see, quite a number of media houses are gathered to hear what they have to say or what the latest is from the IEBC. Speaking yesterday, the chairman said there is no way that the, the two commissioners can just walk back to the commission after making a very dramatic exit in April of, on, in April on the 16th. As mentioned earlier, Commissioner Mwachanya spoke to our Salim Swale, who says, who, and she told him that they're waiting outside the anniversary towers office of the chairman, Wafula Chebukati. But here is what he had to say yesterday in a statement. The latest InfoTrack research and consulting findings show that a majority of Kenyans are in favor of the disbandment of the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission and want it formed afresh. The majority also have no confidence in the IBC's ability to organize credible elections in the future. We've seen that electoral justice continues to be a major concern. People are not happy with the IEBC and do not believe that it can deliver credible in, uh, elections as currently constituted. And there needs to be an effective and open and honest national conversation about how we are going to conduct elections in the future. The public sentiment notwithstanding, Commissioners Maina and Mwachanya at least have made their intent to return to office known. On Friday, making their initial foray since their resignation in April to the anniversary towers where the commission sits. And they intend to do so on Monday, on the grounds that President Uhuru Kenyatta, to whom they tendered their resignation, fails to initiate the process of their replacement. In sworn affidavits, all three submitted to the court that they tendered their resignations to the president on April the 16th and that it was he who failed to act on their notice and effectively rejected their resignations. Miners' replying affidavit in the Okia Omtata case illustratively reads, As far as I'm concerned, I have resigned as a commissioner, but my resignation is yet to be officially communicated and no vacancy has been declared. 
Section 7A of the IEBC Act provides that the President shall publish a notice of vacancy in the Gazette within seven days of the occurrence of such vacancy. Whenever a vacancy arises, the recruitment of a new chairperson or member under this Act shall commence immediately after the declaration of the vacancy by the President. The impediment in this instance, according to the lead of the majority, Aidan Duwale, is legislative. So the mistake is not them. The mistake is the country, and more so parliament, which has a mandate in terms of uh, making legislation to fast track the League of Regime and put in place the selection panel for the president to kickstart the process of appointing new commissioners. Okay. But as far as the IEBC chairman Wafula Chabukati is concerned, Mine and Mwachanya cannot simply waltz back into the commission as though their very public resignations were of no consequence. In a statement to NTV, Chabukati took the view that the matter of the resignation of the former commissioners was long settled, not just by their public statement read out on the 15th of April this year, but they also filled and submitted the clearance forms, having surrendered the commission's assets and being cleared by the secretariat. Additionally, they each saw affidavits affirming their resignations in High Court Petition 160 of 2018. They also deposed under oath that they had submitted their letters to the president. More importantly, the judgment delivered by the High Court in Petition 212 of 2018, while affirming that the commission is properly constituted, noted that the former commissioners did not follow due process in resigning. However, the court further noted that it had taken judicial notice of the fact of the public action and decision of the commissioners in resigning and made further observation that the vacancies should be filled by appointment of new commissioners. It remains to be seen which faction of the IEBC will carry the day as the chairman remains embroiled in a legal battle with suspended CEO Ezra Chiloba. Olive Barrows, NTV. From electoral matters to President Uhuru Kenyatta's trip to the U.S., he will today, this evening, at local, on, which is local time, expect, he is expected to meet with U.S. President Donald Trump. He arrived in Washington, D.C. late on Saturday night, having departed the country on Friday. Foreign Affairs Cabinet Secretary Monica Juma, who is accompanying the president, says the two leaders will discuss, among other things, how Kenya can further benefit from the African Growth and Opportunity Act, more popularly known as a Goa, as Kenya prepares for direct flights to the U.S. starting end of October. The security situations in Somalia and South Sudan will also be canvassed. Pictures there from Washington, D.C., where President Uhuru Kenyatta presently is and where he's also expected to meet members of the business community. Parliament's Public Accounts Committee has summoned Sports Principal Secretary Kirimi Kabiria to explain the loss of 1.7 billion shillings meant for the World Under-18 Championship. This is nearly half of the funds allocated for the tournament. A major sporting scandal... working here 
And this has to be made very, very clear to the country that there's no place for former commissioners in the IEBC. So mine is to say that they came on Friday and uh, we were surprised to learn that they had retained some of the keys which they had not handed over and accessed their offices. But that has now been rectified and uh, today they came back to see me but we had prearranged meetings meetings which are for activities of the commission and those meetings are ongoing up to now so i didn't manage to see them but i asked them to go and put in writing what they want to see me about and if and when they do so then we shall address the issues which they may want to deal with do you read, the mischief, high do you read mischief in their return uh, i think from what you you also see as a kenyan uh, Today actually happens with the day when we promulgated the constitution, the 2010 constitution. And in that constitution we have chapter 6, which deals with the integrity of public servants. And so if you are a former commissioner, you have cleared with the commission, and you walk back saying, I want to sit here and work. There's everything wrong. I mean, it's uh, absolutely wrong for you to go back to where you used to work and say, I want to work, without maybe being reappointed to the position, which again is not possible with the IEBC, because you serve once and go. So uh, it, uh, uh, the issue of whether there's mischief or not, I think all of us can see. Now the High Court ruled that uh, the due resignation process had not been followed. Uh, perhaps your statement now is indeed in contradiction to that ruling, which technically uh, makes them still uh, perfectly uh, remaining in office. Your Marimi. Yes. Marimi, now there is a problem in Kenya. We don't read what's in writing. Uh, I would like you to read that judgment. I think I can even give you a copy today. The judgment is very clear. What the judge said is that the procedure of the commissioners resigning was not clear. And I don't know whether the judge had all the information uh, before her. Because as far as the commissioners are concerned, in another case filed by activist Tom Tata, they saw David saying they wrote to the president. That's all they are required to do. The only shortcoming of that is that they did not copy that letter uh, to the commission. Now, come to that judgment you are talking about. The judge said the resignation was unprocedural, but the judge went ahead and said it's in public domain that these commissioners resigned. And the judge went ahead to say that the, re the replacement of the vacancies must be done by way of appointing new commissioners. That's in the judgment. So I would like you to read the judgment. Let's develop the culture of reading instead of relying on rumors. Finally, the, replace the replacement, is it on course? Y yes, we have gone to Parliament on three, four occasions. Uh, the JLAC, that's the Committee of Parliament which oversights the Commission, is working on a bill. And also the, the Senate Committee uh, is also working on a similar uh, concept. So that we now have a situation where uh, they set up a selection panel and then new commissioners will be recruited. So that's on course and I hope that uh, that will be done. But in the meantime, the activities of the Commission are ongoing. We have uh, post-election evaluation activities. We shall be having a stakeholder conference between 11th and uh, 13th of September, where all stakeholders will come and join us to evaluate what we did in the last uh, election. And uh, many other activities are going ongoing. We have the CVR, the registration of voters is uh, uh, coming up. We have uh, other activities of restructuring. The institution is ongoing. So the commission is in full swing. And we are very busy at the moment. We even have a meeting which is ongoing. So they are coming as a disturbance. Are the commissioners getting full benefits? I'll answer that last question. Uh, which commissioners? No, the commissioners in question. The ex commissioners. The, you know, the salaries of the commissioners of IBC is paid by a consolidated fund. That's through Treasury. It's not the commission that pays. And uh, as, that, as we speak, Immediately they resigned, I wrote to the Treasury, the PS, to stop their salaries. Uh, now, I'm not certain whether that was done, 
up to now I've not got a feedback on my letter but I believe that uh, uh, Treasury acted on the, the recommendations from the Commission that they are no longer in office and I hope they are not being paid. So you're not okay, thank, you thank you The IBC, IBC chairman Wafula Chebukati there responding to the attempted return by two commissioners, Consolat and Katha Maina and Margaret Mwachanya, who resigned in April this year. They resigned alongside Paul Kurgat, who's an ambassador. He hasn't turned up at the commission, with Mwachanya and Maina first showing their faces at the commission on Friday. And what he says, of course, he's mentioned that this happens to be the eighth anniversary of the promulgation of the constitution. But in essence, he says there is no space for the former commissioners, he says there's no space, office space, for commission, commissioners who have resigned from the commission. He also spoke about the High Court ruling that found that the commissioners had not resigned procedurally. He says the court was not in possession of all the facts, as in an affidavit sworn by all three that was presented in the case uh, that Okio Mtata filed in court. They swore that they had written to President Uhuru Kenyatta. The government, on its part, of course, led by... Uh, 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 the national majority leader Aidan Dual is speaking on behalf of the government said the issue is the legislative process that guides the selection of new commissioners so he says that is what um, impeded that process but they say that they wrote to the president and notified the president of their resignation and view the lack of a response or the advertisement of vacancies a rejection of that re resignation and so they've decided to take up their jobs again we'll delve further into that matter with our panel a little bit later on now we go to Parliament, where, as we indicated earlier, the PS of Sports, Kadimi Kabiria, is appearing before the PAC committee. World over, you have those departments, and legal is one of them. So I will be al as allowing Honorable Tiende Amolo, and then Honorable Florence Mutua, and finally Honorable uh, Daniel Rono in that order. But before they come in, just clarify further. When you said you joined the ministry in April 2017, you joined it from where? From which other ministry? I was in the ministry. Of, sorry, uh -huh. chair. Thank you. I was in the ministry of defence. Of defence as a PS. As a PS. Oh, okay. And before that, I was an ambassador, uh, a Kenya's ambassador to Brazil. Okay. Fine. Honourable uh, Tiende. Thank you. I have three questions. First, let me start from where Honourable Bunyoro left. Uh, provision for legal services. If you look at the document, you will see that uh, first there's triple OK advocates, which was paid 11,834,000. You go to the next page, Winnie Wambuga and Company Advocate, 7.8 million. Arimi Kimathi and Company Advocate, 7.6 million. Between these three sets, of law firms, PS, are you listening? Yes, I am, sir. Because <laughs> you are the one I'm addressing. So if you're uh, sorry, uh, sorry, member. Yes. I just wanted him to. I wanted to tell him to listen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Between these three firms, they were paid twenty-seven million two hundred and eighty thousand five hundred and sixty. Now, what I'd like you to help us understand is why it was necessary to contract three different firms of advocates, why it was necessary to pay this amount of money, whether this amount was as per the advocate's remuneration order, and why you did not use the AG's chambers, which would be free, instead of procuring private legal services, which is quite expensive. That's my first question. My second question is in relation to cleaning. If you look at page three, GMON Services, which as per their next year was a cleaning company, it was contracted to clean Kasarani, 13,594,241.80. The contract that is annexed does not show for how long they were cleaning. But more importantly, you come to page four, at the top there, yet another cleaning company, mm. Parapet Cleaning Services, 10 million. 
So for just cleaning, again, you have contracted two cleaning companies at 23 million 594,000. And my question is, why would you need two different companies? In any event, secondly, the sports stadia, it's called the stadia management something. Sport, oh, yes, okay. that one. Do they not ordinarily clean the stadium so that you would not have to spend another 23 million of taxpayers' money merely to clean the stadium? My third and last question is in relation to your response, 4.1. And this is the question of direct procurement. On the question of direct procurement, you make an interesting statement that the EOA supersedes the Public Procurement and Disposal Act. <laughs> P.S. Is there anything that can precede and supersede an act of parliament in this country? But also, the question of direct procurement is regulated by the act, section 103. I'd like you to look at section 103 of the Act. And section 103.2 spells in what circumstances you can do direct procurement. So what I'd like you to tell me is which of those provisions was invoked. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honor uh, Mutwa. Thank you, Chair. My first question is, uh, of course, uh, Honorable Otiende has dealt with it because we are not really convinced about the single sourcing. Uh, but P.S., uh, we would like to know the members of the local organizing committee. Who is, who is in that committee and how is, it was uh, constituted. And um, secondly, uh, these companies that are here are very quite, they are really quite interesting. Honorable Otiende has already dealt with the one for uh, cleaning. I wanted to ask that one, but it's already been uh, asked by Honorable Otiende. Uh, secondly, when you look at this list, there are so many hotels. That's why Honorable Nyoro said, if you look at this list, you will not know if it's, it relates to sports. There are too many hotels. Is it possible for you to furnish uh, uh, the Auditor General's office, all the people who stayed in these hotels, so that at least they can quantify if really the hotels were even used in the first place, <coughs> so that the hotels are not used as conduits to uh, misuse taxpayers' money. Secondly, if you look at this list, we can see funny companies. Eh? We, Chair, we'd like to see the names behind these companies. The PS should furnish all the names of each company here who owns these companies. Because if you look at, uh, you've written here, there is a James Kilonzo here. W written various. What did this James Kilonzo do various? What does that mean? And then you go back down, there is uh, office operations. What, what office operations were this, uh, Buena P.S.? You go down to 21.9 uh, uh, 21 on uh, uh, 21st of September 17. There is a Kawera Women Group. What was Kawera Women Group doing? Was it entertaining people or what? Furniture Dynamics. What was Furniture Dynamics doing? There are so many uh, funny questions about uh, uh, companies here. So it is important for us also to get the people behind the companies, if they are registered, and what they actually do, so that we can know if it really relates to the current list that you have. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, before you go to Honorable Burono, uh, when I appear just to clarify what Honorable Mutua was asking, uh, please uh, arrange to furnish us with the, the directorships of these companies, all of them, uh, and what specific jobs they did. Okay, I think it's very easy to do, to do so. Uh, secondly, furnish us with the full list of the membership of the event organizing committee, the local event organizing committee, okay, uh, and how it was constituted. Honorable Borono. Yes, Chair, my name is uh, Daniel Rono. Now, that, that we need in the next one week, if possible. Yeah. Yeah, I am BK South. Uh, some element of my question has been uh, uh, tied on by the chair about the furnishing of the details of what uh, these companies actually uh, uh, did. I just wanted to know, uh, chair, 
it took quite some time to prepare for this event. Whether the expenditures that were incurred earlier are compacted in this 1.7 uh, million LMA, or it's outside that uh, expenditure of uh, 1.7. And then uh, uh, extension of uh, our lawyer uh, here uh, question, if some element of, the, uh, of procurement was done direct uh, uh, procurement without following this public procurement as an asset disposals. Uh, which particular uh, jobs were done direct procurement as uh, the chairman has said, you give us the detailed uh, uh, jobs that were done and if direct procurement was done in those uh, particular companies or uh, they were subjected to the public procurement and asset uh, disposals. Lastly, uh, Chair, I just wanted to know, uh, we have been told the benefits of this uh, hosting of this event were immense. I don't know whether we are able to actually quantify the benefits vis-a-vis -vis the expenditure that we, we incurred. Okay. Yeah. Bona Pierce, please respond. Mm -hmm. On that, on that okay. Okay. Just proceed. Thank you very much, Chair, uh, for the questions. I'll start with the uh, Honorable Chinde. Uh, uh, the issue of cleaning uh, services, uh, we had two venues. We had Kenyatta University and we had the stadium. Kenyatta University had 2,000 plus uh, athletes. They had uh, dormitory, uh, dormitory sort of, the hostels. It was the village. There we had a lot of need for cleaning, from laundry to physical cleaning. You can imagine 2,000 people in one area. The other one was the stadium. In fact, the stadium had a very heavy need for cleaning because everyone saw we had over 60,000 people at that field at almost any given day. But even more important, on that very first day, the opening ceremony, it rained so hard, we had actually to stop everything and dry the, the field again uh, physically. We got the company to do this. The amount of time that they spent doing this was uh, from just before the event began to after, just after the event ended. So that was about eight days of cleaning throughout. Uh, on the issue of uh, <coughs> the relevance of PMFA, the act vis-a-vis -vis the rules and uh, regulations of IWF, under uh, Section 221, uh, uh, acceptance of rights and obligations in the agreement that we signed with uh, uh, IWAF, it is uh, stated that we will uh, agree to their rules. Who signed it on behalf of, of Kenya? It's signed by, on behalf of Kenya by the ministry. Which means his force? Yes. Okay. Proceed. And uh, I don't know if I need to read that, but I will uh, I will also uh, offer this 2.221 two uh, two, two one and 2.221, two, two. Two, two one, the one uh, on acceptance of rights and obligations. Can you please read it for record purposes? <coughs> okay, for record purposes it reads, the organizing member and the hosting institution hereby accept and undertake to fully comply with all the rights and obligations in respect of the event uh, contemplated by the agreement and in particular to organize and stage the event in accordance with the terms and conditions of the agreement and the IWAF regulations. Which part of what you've read authorizes superseding of the act it doesn't supersede the act 
Uh, okay. Do, do you have a lawyer, a lawyer with you? Yes, yeah. A legal counsel? Okay. okay. He also gives me <coughs> that there is a, a part. Could he read that? It's <laughs> <laughs> Could, could this be treated in the same manner you treat treaties, national treaties? It, it, if I may know, yeah. as a layman. Yes. The council, please answer that. Yes, there is, there is a provision in the, uh, in the act. Eh? No, just in answer first. Yes. Is it, is it like a, a national yes. treaty? Uh, Do you treat uh, this particular agreement? No, in procurement, the, the procurement act actually... I haven't gone to procurement. Yes, answer it's not like that. <laughs> So what is it? So does it form part of the Kenyan law once, you are, once, the, once Kenya uh, uh, signs it? That's what I wanted to ask. You, you are talking of... Uh, that agreement? Of, yes, that one, yes, it's like that. Sorry. Does it form the EOA? Yeah. Does it form... The Sports PS, they are appearing before the Public, uh, Public Accounts Committee of the National Assembly. That is Kijimi Kabiria. And we, let's look at some of those figures. Um, the Auditor General raised these questions for the 2016-17 financial year. And uh, the amount in question is 1.7 billion shillings, which is half of the three, about half of the 3.5 billion shillings allocated to the Ministry of Sports for the World Under-18 Championship held last year. And the numbers in question, he questions how uh, 349 million shillings was lost through direct procurement. Of course, that is in direct contravention of the Public Procurement and Assets Disposal Act. Out of that amount, 60 million shillings was used for the procurement of taxi services from uh, Perwin Cabs, uh, an amount that was 23.8 million shillings above the market rate. The same company was paid another 30.8 million shillings. That is for dry cleaning and laundry services by the local organizing committee. And that was paid under Sports Kenya. Then the organizing committee did also not provide uh, supporting documentation for another 204 million in expenditure. And uh, this amount included 70.5 million shillings paid to the sports marketing company Inter Management Group, despite them not having placed an advert. Then there were no documents to show that uh, Protal Studios were paid some 67.5 million shillings for media agency services. Protel Studio is also in focus for being one of the companies that won contracts despite using expired tax compliance certificates. Another 3.3 million shillings was paid to Safaricom for the supply of mobile phones. However, no list of officials who received the phones was supplied and the phones were also not availed for audit verification. The committee also paid some 11 million shillings to Ramji Haribai Davani Limited for the supply of petroleum products. However, they agreed a discount of 4 shillings and 25 cents on the energy regulatory unit price was not passed on to the local organizing committee despite it being in the contract. The auditor also questioned why the committee bought fuel in bulk, yet they had hired buses, minibuses, vans, saloon cars and luxury cars which drew fuel. And uh, 130 parking lights worth 3.6 million shillings were installed in an effort to spruce up the Kasarani Stadium ahead of the tournament. They were, however, stolen after the event. And the Auditor General found no evidence that the lights had been replaced or restored, even though the theft was reported to the Kasarani Stadium police. Uh, and this is only the latest scandal to hit the sports ministry, falling hot on the heels of the Rio Olympics debacle, where issues from missing kits, overinflated air tickets, and joyriders overshadowed Kenya's success on the track in 2016. And uh, the report comes out just a month after IAAF handed Kenya the rights to host the 2020 IAAF World Athletics Under-20 Championship. And this uh, was followed... Um, what was on the surface a largely successful World Under-18 Championship with a record 60,000 fans thronging the Kasarani Stadium on the final day. But this is definitely selling uh, what we thought was a successful event. And not to mention the copy-pasting of a report by parliamentarians on the MPs who attended the World Cup just earlier uh, this year. And that brings me to our panelists on my left. 
is uh, Felix Odhiambo of the Electoral Law and Governance Institute for Africa. On his left is uh, Bessie Gadambi, who's a governance analyst. Thank you very much for joining us again, Bessie. And uh, an advocate of the High Court of Kenya, that is uh, Dr. Alutalala Mukwana. Karibuni sana. So let's start with the sports ministry. It appears to be scandal after scandal after scandal. What are we not getting right there? Felix, let's start with you. Well, I think it is uh, an information. Uh, I mean, Kenyans are increasingly getting used to uh, massive uh, scandals being unearthed by the Office of the Regis uh, Auditor General uh, year in, year out. And I think if my recollection serves me right, uh, the latest uh, uh, scandal involving this ministry is one in, in, in a series of many uh, involving other departments of government including um, NYS, uh, uh, the, power, the power and the energy sector among other things. Uh, the fundamental question is uh, what are we not getting right uh, with the kind of uh, legal and constitutional framework that we have uh, in place that, that were intended to uh, promote integrity, that were intended to promote good governance. And yet, uh, with these legislations and with uh, multiple of agencies uh, that are charged with the responsibility of fighting corruption, uh, we still have uh, problems of integrity coming in every now and then. I think, uh, having said that, I think we, it is also incumbent upon us to loud recent efforts uh, that we have seen, the new impetus in fighting corruption, uh, the new director of public prosecution, uh, the coordination with other sectors and agencies like the Director of Criminal Investigation and uh, Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. I hope that uh, Parliament will take a cue uh, from uh, these multi, uh, multiple coordinating agencies. Uh, and for the first time, uh, have it right, the committee meetings, I mean, parliamentary committee act as quasi-judicial uh, entities. And yet, when we recall the saga surrounding the investigation around the Ruaraka land, etc., uh, parliament or parliamentary committees have not stepped up to uh, their mandate. And so I hope that they will be able to uh, look at the Auditor General's report, which, by the way, is authoritative. Uh, ever since. I think well, that is one ag uh, agency of government that has been actually doing its, its work. Okay. And they should be able then to base, uh, the look at those findings with a view to bringing uh, officials of the sports ministry and indeed uh, any other sector to book. Okay. Yeah. Let's say I want you to come in there. And limit, I would like to limit your comments to the sports ministry uh, because this is not the first time that a scandal, as we mentioned, has come out of the ministry. Has it been an issue of leadership? Have we not taken our sportsmen seriously enough? Well, for one thing, what I know about the sports ministry is that is we, we have one, misguided objectives in terms of what is of priority, what is of value to this country as a sport. And then when you look at the people who hold these particular uh, positions, is either they don't know how key sports is for this country. So if we have people who understood what the sports industry can do for Kenyans, then we would not be having the kind of scandal, uh, scandals we have. But it's more so like it's also becoming a, a, a culture that we are entertaining. Every day, ev the sports ministry has had scandal after scandal, and nobody tells us the end of it. So if we don't value sport that much, then I can see why I can siphon as much money for taxi. Uh, you know, I've had you read, and I was wondering, we pay laundry for what? Who are we paying for laundry? Yeah, such kind of things tells you also that, that we don't value sports in this country. We've not valued it from now and, and even at the back, going backwards. So there's need for us to have people who hold position, these positions with an understanding of what sports can do for this country. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Mukwana, do you foresee any uh, forward moving action? from the parliamentary committee because the parliamentary committee is whole sitting after sitting after uh, sitting. What comes out of it? Olive, uh, when I got an invitation, uh, first of all, thank you for the invite and uh, congratulations for your new job. Uh, you. Nice to have you at NTV. Uh, when I got this invitation, uh, my question, my first question on my mind was, is it really worth spending time discussing on the topic of corruption? be it uh, the Ministry of Sports, be it uh, the Office of the Auditor General, wherever it will be. And allow me to read this uh, definition of us 
And at the end of it, my colleagues and yourself maybe can ex try and tell me whether it fits into who we are. Now, this is in 1789, way back in 1789, and this is the Encyclopedia Britannica. It defines who the Negroes are. Negroes is a general term used to refer to the blacks. Uh, disregard the negativity, but it refers to the blacks. And this is what this 1798 Encyclopedia Britannica defines the black person. And it says that this is a name given to a variety of the human species who are entirely black and are found in the torrid zone, especially in that part of Africa which lies within the tropics. That's not it. And now the, here is how we are defined. Vices, the most notorious, seem to be the, the portion of this, of this unhappy race, idleness, treachery, revenge, cruelty, stealing, lying, profanity, and nastiness, have extinguished the principles of natural law and to have silenced the ripples of conscience. They are strangers to every sentiment of compassion and are awful example of the corruption of man when left to himself. I tell you, that sounds a bit harsh. Thank you. I want your definition of harsh. The reason why I have read this, when I came across the definition, I asked myself, Olive, what is it about us Kenyans? Because this sports ministry scandal you are talking about is not new. Not in the sports ministry, not in Kenya. So the problem clearly we should be discussing is not what is the problem with the sports ministry. The problem we should be discussing is what is the problem with we as a people in Kenya? Mwafrika, shidakenini. And our problem is that we are a thoroughly dishonest species. Wherever we are placed, we look at the first opportunity to defraud the other, the first opportunity to be ahead of the other, and it does not matter how we get there. That's what defines us. There is a very hilarious saying in Kikuyu, which says that Ambaye Anaiba Nasiposhikwa Anakula Hakiyake. Think about that. That's who we are. Thank you. Okay, but I would like to bring it back to my question, <laughs> yes. which was, do you foresee anything coming out of this probe by the well, MPs? Because the MPs themselves have been implicated Thank you. in taking, uh, what was it, blue envelopes, uh, is I think how we're talking about it, of 10,000 shillings. Thank you. Olive, I thought I had answered. But if you want me to break it down, <laughs> break it down for let me please. break it down. <laughs> the parliamentarians originate from amongst us. True or false? True. They are a reflection of who we are. And these parliamentarians, believe you me, how an imam luki wakukodishwa, they are on hire and they'll play the game depending on where the sweetest reward comes from. It is abnormal even for you to expect, Olive, that the parliamentarians will solve the problem that we have. So in my view, the solution to the corruption in this country lies elsewhere, not within parliament. Okay, then what then? <laughs> Number one, we need a radical surgery of our own values as a people. We need to understand that the end should never be justifying the means. We have what you call national values in the constitution. I keep saying there is no such thing as national values because we have no nation in the first place. What we have is a collection of our tribal communities having various values. I've just cited what they have community values as hakiao if you're not caught. We have different values as a people. We need to agree on what is right for Kenya. If the national values in the constitution are what you've agreed upon, then we must accept that we must be guided by the national values. Okay. Simple. All right. And, and Bessie, you were nodding very vigorously. But <laughs> you're nodding as well, Felix. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Chabukati raised the fact that this is the eighth anniversary of the promulgation of the Constitution. Dr. is talking about national values. Is there any point to that chapter in the Constitution? Well, I think 
uh, Doc is being too extreme. He's being a little bit too harsh. One of the things he has said is a culture. Well, we have a nation. I believe I am a Kenyan, and I am proud to be a Kenyan. That, I would not trade my country for anything. But when it comes to our culture, we, have, we, are, we are not culture to value, to our value system. Our value system has been corrupted. And instead of us throwing away what we call ourselves as Kenyans, we need to work on that value system. Why is it I agree on the beat of our culture? Is that we are telling our children it is okay to steal as long as we are not caught. We have had that because even when you did your survey and you asked a few young people, young men and women, they said as long as I'm not caught, I can steal. So what we have been entrenching in us is that when I sit on any position today, if I'm appointed maybe the PS and I find a loophole that makes sure that I will not be caught, the tendency would be that I would also steal. But what have we done to remove that culture because we are glorifying people who have been stealing? I never knew Greeters or the lady for NYS, but do you know our children know who is in Greeters? But we've not brought in Paul Terragat, who has brought the sports torch to this country called Kenya. Nobody goes, if you say you're Kenya, you're the people who run anywhere you go outside the country. But we don't know who is Paul Terragat. It's the culture we have, okay. we are entrenching in our, in our children. children. Yeah. Felix, if you could come in there. Yes, uh, I mean, uh, it's true. Chairman Shebukati reminded us that uh, this is an anniversary of uh, that uh, since the promulgation of the 2010 constitution. And uh, if the constitution wants to be audited, and I agree with uh, Basie and Dr. Uh, one of the gaps in so far as the implementation of the constitution is concerned, uh, is actually on values and uh, 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 chap uh, chap Article 10, values and principles, and Chapter 6 on leadership and integrity. And one of the reasons why the t uh, 2010 Constitution was hailed as both transformative and progressive was the entrenchment of these values and principles and chapters on it, leadership and integrity, which, by the way, is missing even in the South African Constitution that we heavily borrowed from. And uh, the gap is that uh, we live to these constitutional aspirations and principles and the question to that uh, the answer to that question is no but with respect to your specific question as to whether parliament would be able to discharge this function and again, uh, again it takes us back to uh, auditing the constitution i think one of the gaps and the failures that we have seen since 2010 is actually the role of parliament uh, in my view, Parliament has not quite internalized the role of Parliament in a presidential, in a pure presidential system. And if you look at the conduct of the MPs, uh, the partisanship, the brickmanship, etc., with which uh, business is in Parliament is transacted, uh, you get a feeling that they are still caught up in the parliamentary system, uh, the system that is in pl a place in the UK, where a pa members of Parliament must be loyal to uh, the Prime Minister, etc. In a pure presidential system, and that is where the gap is, a parliament, regardless and irrespective of party affiliation, must oversight the executive. Uh, the question is, has parliament lived up to this, uh, the, 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 this uh, constitutional role, at least compared to the, uh, the United States Congress, that is the system that we base this on? In 1974, during the impeachment process of uh, uh, President Nixon, it is the re Republican-dominated uh, parliament that actually went to the re a Republican president and told them the jig was up. You had to resign. But if you compare that with our parliament and look at the way uh, that our parliament behaves, uh, there is a serious gap in terms of understanding their role in a pure presidential system. Okay. And having said that, therefore, then parliament inspires, uh, whether parliament or parliamentary committees, uh, inspires very little confidence in terms of uh, dealing with this. And thank God, the speakers flagged this several times. And I think uh, Speaker J.B. Muturi has been uh, very, very robust in trying to remind Parliament of their role okay. uh, insofar as Dr. oversight Ari, is concerned. Um, Felix raises a good point. He says Parliament has not fully understood uh, what its role is and has been playing loyalty politics. Um, in fact, opposition leader Raila Odinga defined them as the weakest link uh, so far now in the war against graft. Do you agree that Parliament has not fully embraced its, its role? Yes and no. You know, my brother Felix, I've, I've had an opportunity to listen to him before and he's a very polite guy. 
and uh, he's actually being polite to the parliamentarians uh, because th the truth is that the parliamentarians are not fools. We have lawyers in that house and very highly educated guys. Of course, you have a mixture, but it is not that parliamentarians have not understood their role. Felix is just being polite. These parliamentarians, for you to understand why parliamentarians are doing what they're doing and how they're doing it, you must trace to their origin before they came to the house. These parliamentarians came through an election, a supposed election. Then you go back and ask at how elections are done, who determines who gets what position. And you then start, things start ringing into your mind about the server, about Hakietu, and you realize that the people who control things in this country determine who is elected in parliament. So for us even to vest the authority of oversight on parliamentarians, we are moving with a presumption that these parliamentarians legitimately got elected into parliament. But only if there are parliamentarians in that parliament who owe their positions to their principles up there. Simple and plain. So they are in parliament for a cause to particularly fulfill the mandate, the unofficial mandate of their superiors. And that explains why, uh, F uh, Felix, we will never have a scenario of the 1974 impeachment in the U.S. that you've, you've, you've related to. Because you cannot have any parliamentarian standing up to impeach a president or a, or a president, for example, for whom he's grateful for having brought him in parliament. So the problem we have in this country, you must go back to the big elephant in the room on the issue of transparency, accountability in how we do our public affairs, chief being our elections. Look at the drama we are being treated to at adversary towers. In any civilized country, these fellows will not even have the temerity to do what they are doing. Why are they doing it? Same, same thread. That goes back to how they came to those offices. They owe it to somebody. They are doing what they are doing because when they resigned, it was not supposed to be a resignation. The motive was different. Since the motive was not achieved, hey, let's go back and have a second bite of the sherry. Come on, okay. Olive. These let's things see, originate let's see, I want elsewhere. To, to bring it to you, I mean, uh, Dr. Lee has brought it full circle. Now we are back at the anniversary yeah, towers. He blindly. says, yeah. anywhere else in the world, they would not have the temerity to do what they're doing. Do you agree with him that there is somebody behind the scenes pulling the strings? Oh. Yeah, we are, well, we are being entertained with the puppet show here because we have puppets. That's what he's saying in sh very simple terms. We have puppets. But before that, he's talking about the political, the, the people in parliament having someone to all to. But I don't think so. Their role here is that they're still political toddlers. They don't understand that they have, they have a role and a key role. So you can't expect a toddler to be doing a grown-up thing. They have not grown. They don't have the political maturity. Neither the stamina to understand when they are called honorable members. You're talking about the blue envelopes that Retangular was talking about. Unless you're really immature or mature, you should be able to distinguish the kind of position you hold in that parliament, how honorable you are. When we come back to the two who are insisting that they have to come come back to IEBC, I mean, it's really a sham and a shame for them because you cannot have called us in public, in day broad daylight, accuse the very person that you are telling, I want to come, give me space to work, that he is not able to control the commission. So if you are being errant, you've already excluded and exited. Please stay there. Yeah? It's okay. time you stayed away and we will now be able to deal with you following the law. All right. Yes. Felix. Uh, <laughs> Dr. He said, or oh, he, he, he imputed that the resignations were not really resignations. Were they resignations to you? For the IEB, uh, of the IEBC commissioners. Yes. And let me try to be as blunt as possible. Take a cue under the advice of my learned senior. Uh, with respect to IEBC, uh, first of all, I agree with uh, my colleagues here. But also, uh, I really hope that the two commissioners... Uh, ex-commissioners, I want to use uh, Chebukati's word, uh, actually truly live in this country. Uh, if they do, then they should have been able to follow the public uproar regarding their purported return to work. Uh, the country, for the first time, is very unanimous in this. There seems to me to be a bipartisan 
uh, spirit in condemning the actions and things like that. But having said that, let me put things into perspective. Uh, on this particular issue, I agree with Chairman Chebukati. Uh, we haven't actually followed the court ruling that we seem to be uh, erroneously basing our uh, opinion on, uh, but we have also forgotten uh, to retrace uh, the circumstances that triggered their resignation. Number one, uh, and as affirmed by the, 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 the court ruling uh, that, uh, that we've seen, Chebukati actually made reference to it, is that one, on uh, the 15th of April, the two commissioners publicly resigned. And in their resignation, they were in solidarity with CEO Ezra Chiloba, whom they took offense with the suspension. And they also indicted Chebukati on what they said were, were serious and catastrophic weaknesses in leadership. Now, Chebukati is still the chair of the IABC, and uh, Chiloba is still suspended. Now, the first question is, what has changed? Number two is that on following their resignation, they went to the IABC commissioners, and I did due diligence on this, and established that they actually filed their clearance certificates. If, if you know that if you are leaving and vacating a job, you must fill a form that effectively discharges you from that position. That was one. Now, the third point, which is more, very fundamental, is that on the basis of their own sworn affidavits, their own sworn testimonies, they confirmed the fact of their resignation which was followed by a deposition. A deposition in law is a written statement under oath that they had actually vacated their position. And then finally, by their action of uh, abdicating from work for the last four months, it confirms both constructively and actively of the fact, of the, of the fact that they were no longer at IEBC. Now for them to purport to come back, and by the way, these two commissioners were were the born in, I mean, the greatest uh, impediment to democratic elections last time. They have no demonstrated track record of effective election management. We don't need them. They are better managers in this country on elections. They are, they are both clueless, as I said repeatedly in 2017, about election management. Now, for them to purport to want to come back is epitomizes a serious electoral impunity, electoral authoritarianism and a culture that violates both their personal integrity and their uh, public integrity. Chebukat is right, they are ex-commissioners, and they actually should step aside. And by the way, finally, la one last thing. The fact of, s the, the law is clear. Once you write to the president, which they post under oath, their responsibility rests at that. It is not there is, uh, it doesn't then go further to say that the president did not respond to our letters. They had effectively resigned and they should step outside. Okay, so we will pursue that further. Um, I know, Doctor, you challenged him to speak straight and he's pulled no punches. Thank you. <laughs> we take a short break now, but we'll be back with more on that discussion.
Welcome back. You're watching NTV Today and I'm joined by three panelists. That is uh, Felix Odhiambo of the Electoral Law and Governance Institute for Africa, uh, Bessie Kadambi, who's a governance analyst, and Dr. Mukwana, uh, Dr. Mukwana, who is uh, an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. And before we went on the break, we're discussing uh, the corruption scandals that have rocked the country. We've discussed everything from the sports ministry, uh, the PS sports appearing now before the Public Accounts Committee of the National Assembly, and uh, the, what is happening at the IBC. We just had from the chairman who said there is no room for the two commissioners seeking to, what some have said, sneak back into the commission after resigning in April. That was on April 16th. And the two commissioners in question are Consolata and Kathamina and Margaret Machanya. We are yet to hear from them, but we expect to do so. Um, back to the conversation at hand. Uh, Felix raised um, a number of issues before we went on the break and he pulled no punches. Uh, Dr. I, were you happy with that particular response in that? <laughs> Uh, where, where graft in the country is concerned. Yeah, he, he, he was spot on, uh, to be fair to him. He was spot on. Uh, Olive, I have said and I repeat that the issue of corruption is taking too much of our time. Actually, here, in this conversation, we ought to be discussing on what is the best way, which means how should we develop our livelihoods. That is what people who have gone to school should be discussing. We have young people who have no jobs. We have... You go to every slum around here, you find so many young men just seated by the roadside. Unfortunately, the politicians create their agenda. We discuss what they want. So the discussion today is not you who has set it. The discussion agenda has been set elsewhere. So we find ourselves talking about it. Corruption, what I prefer to call theft, because when you call corruption, you're giving it a very nice name. It is theft is not going to go away. Number one, I have said that our values are wrong. Number two, we are okay that we have the values in the constitution, but the implementation is near zero. Why are we implementing near zero? Because in every society, there are people whom we call leaders, whose responsibility is to enforce what the society has agreed that ought to be our binding values and rules. Unfortunately, again, we go to the same melodrama, that our leaders are the problem. Our leaders have failed to enforce the integrity rules. Look at 2017, before the elections. There is this requirement that every member of parliament to be eligible to vie must have a university degree. The reason was because the tasks up there are such that there is some minimum intellectual competence that a member of parliament must have. So when my sister describes them as immature, I don't agree with it, but yes, she, she might be having a point. What did the parliamentarians do? They simply implemented for the governors. They said governors should have a degree. But for themselves, postponed. It was postponed from 20, 2013. 2017 was postponed, maybe it will come in 2022. What am I saying? Leadership crisis. I said before that the moment the person who is supposed to slay the dragon of corruption decides it will be slain, and that is Honorable Uhuru Kenyatta, you are seeing it begin to happen. Okay. He is the man who will decide that the enough is enough. Because these corruption syndicates have the highest authorities out there. And do not cheat yourself, Olive. You are not going to be a PS, sanction expenditure of 200 plus millions without documentation, if you do not know who is backing you. Okay. That money does not end with that PS. That money ends somewhere else. And those are the forces behind the corruption in this country. They are called the deep state. It is a state which is not official, but it's a state indeed. Okay. The president has to deal with the deep state, and everything will fall in place. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ray. Felix, I want to bring you back to the IBC. You were speaking about the IBC before we went to the, on, the, on the break. Mm -hmm. And when I said you pulled no punches, you pulled no punches when you made reference to Nkatha Mina and uh, Margaret Mwachanya. It seems you didn't hold in very high regard their contribution to the IEBC. Uh, could their return have been informed by the audit queries that have been raised? I don't know that you read the paper over the weekend, but the Auditor General has raised certain queries with regard to the last election, mm -hmm. uh, which were raised in an internal audit and which informed, of course, the suspension of uh, Ezra Chiloba. Could their attempted return to the commission be informed by those questions? Well, it, it is possible. And so it, it's also equally possible that their return to the IBC or their decision to want to return uh, has also been motivated by two other things. One, they found out that the, outsi uh, the outside world there is very cold. Uh, no parks, no bodyguards, no nothing. Uh, but also most fundamentally, uh, it is possible and rightfully conceivable that their return may have been motivated by the politics of the 2022 elections. Uh, for if you are in doubt about their competence, you only need to read uh, the exit memo of Rosalind Akombe. And uh, you, don't have, you don't have to be a brain surgeon to put faces uh, to the writings and things like that. But having said that, I'm one person who subsequent to the elections, held meetings with Chairman Chebukati and, uh, and in the spirit of the handshake. And I told myself that if under the new spirit of the handshake, where the president is demonstrating serious efforts uh, in combating corruption, in uh, uh, promoting inclusivity and national cohesion, and in dealing with the, one of the major elephants in the room, and that is the electoral justice in this country, then we ought to support the president. As a result of the building bridges process, it is no longer an issue as to the legitimacy of President Uhuru Kenyatta. I think it's legitimately in office. But the issues of credibility that surrounded the 2017 elections must be addressed because if we don't address them, they will recur in 2022 with catastrophic consequences. And yes, one such issues, and I said it repeatedly in 2017, was the question of election integrity. And what we saw, the 4.6 billion shillings, is just a tip of the, uh, 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 you know, uh, well, what is the expression? The iceberg. The tip of the iceberg. The, if you open up that audit to look at the August 8th election and a look at the procurement of the Kim's kits, where uh, uh, Otimo forgot, you know, got uh, 3.8 billion shillings to supply that, the, the, there were serious issues of integrity that fall squarely in the face or in the doorsteps of the CEO and the Secretariat of the Commission. And uh, we have to resolve that. Why? Because in this country, election integrity is called the deep state that the, uh, the Dr. made reference to, and uh, may add to that the state capture. Questions of in election integrity have direct bearing on the electoral outcomes. You, it's quid pro quo. You allowed the Secretariat to be involved in corruption so that they can look the other side when state capture in the deep state are manifesting and manipulating things to win the elections. Be that as it may, I think the integrity issues of the 4.6 billion must be addressed just like the sports ministry and things like that. And if these uh, 4.6 billion can be proved, and by the way, part of the integrity issues involve the, the former vice chair, Nkatha herself, uh, I think uh, to the tune of two, bill, uh, two million shillings. These issues must be addressed. And if we, we have to resolve the integrity issues that surround the 2017 election, even if it means that the entire secretariat must be constituted. Okay. I'm going to have to come back to you two gentlemen a bit later to explain to me exactly what this deep state you're talking about is. Um, but Bessie... Um, What's what's your what are your thoughts on on their return? What is the motive, in your opinion? What what has motivated their return to the commission? I think it's also uh, is a misguided uh, interpretation of the court ruling that they thought because they the court has said that they, were, they didn't follow due process that their earlier mistake has been rectified or has been sanitized by the court. What they didn't care to understand is the impl implications of that court ruling. However, for them to come back, when we have their own internal audit saying that they have lost 4.6 billion, this is the part where I ask myself that DCI, uh, DCI should be there 
pouncing on them. This is not an external person coming in to say you have stolen 4.6. It is their own internal audit that has put them on check. That alone by itself, integrity has been tainted. So they can't come back to office. Two, I expect also the, the anti-corruption body to be on their case and charge them because this is something from within. These are people who are being accused. There's evidence for it. Then we have what I've been asking. Yes, we hear money is taken. Money is paid from somewhere. It's paid from treasury. And as long as treasury is paying out this money, someone somewhere benefits. If treasury cannot get back that money, then someone, we, we, we will have this conversation day in, day out. Our money has to come back. However it was paid, whoever was paid, let them return the money and ask for amnesty. Maybe we can consider it. But that money has to come back. Okay. Their motivation mainly, I think, is a misguided aspect of the judgment that was given. Interpretation of the court ruling. Yes, okay. and that maybe gave them the opportunity now because the audit has come out uh, bearing, pointing fingers who did what. So it's now coming to clean up what they can get away with. But I'll it has to stop. point out one thing on that court judgment, which I agree with my sister here, is misguided. In the same ruling at paragraph 29, the learned judge proceeded to acknowledge the fact of their public resignation and directed the appointing authorities to move with the speed to expeditiously fill the vacancies. So they are wrong. They are misreading. They are not reading the entire uh, judgment. Paragraph 29 of that judgment is clear. The judge, the, the judge faulted them for a procedural resignation. And by the way, it is clear that a lot of evidence and materials were not placed before that judge. Because in another case, the Okeo Mtata case, by their own sworn affidavits, they confirmed to the fact that they had resigned. Mm -hmm. And their deposition in that very uh, case, they acknowledged the fact that they had written to the president communicating their resignation. Their law is clear. Their task ends at that. It is not for them to compel the president to act on their letter. And the fact that a, select, an, a, a, recre, a, a recruitment process had not been initiated is neither here nor there, and they cannot rely on that. Okay. Dr. are they being oblivious to what President Uhuru Kenyatta aptly described as the public mood? Because uh, InfoTrack released um, poll results yesterday, which showed that 51% of Kenyans are not in support of their return. 41% of Kenyans have absolutely no trust in the IBC to conduct credible polls as presently constituted in future. <clears throat> no, they are not being oblivious. These are smart chaps. They know what they're doing. These are people who know why they were appointed there. They were fit for purpose. I've told people many times that in this country, you don't get such high-ranking positions unless you are fit for purpose. You may have all the PhDs in the world, you will not get those appointments unless you are fit for purpose. So these ladies and, the, and one gentleman, I think, know what they're doing. I have said that their resignation was tailored to achieve a certain objective. That objective was not achieved. And that therefore should explain why the relevant authorities did not activate the requisite follow-up mechanism so that these fellows could go home. It's not that they didn't know. And now that that objective was not achieved, they have decided to come back to have a second attempt. What my late professor, uh, the late uh, uh, just uh, our convincing guru, said to have a second bite at the sherry. They are not foolish. But they must get a reason for coming back. And that reason is the court judgment. Olive, if you want a court to give you guidance on a decision you have made, you apply to, go to, to court and get what we call the legal interpretation of that particular decision. These fellows did not apply to court to get an interpretation. They cannot therefore now claim to fish somewhere from within the decision of the court and say, hey, wait a minute, we resigned, yes, we handed over, yes, but now that the court says 
we did not resign properly, we are back. That is dishonesty, but it's a dishonesty that is choreographed, it's a dishonesty that is intended to achieve the reason why they are in that commission. Do not forget that the act, the election act amendment that was done when Jubilee was fighting NASA, that effectively made elections this country to be manual. Nobody's talking about it. And there lies the time bomb. This, this IEBC is a sitting time bomb. By now it should have gone home. Why is it not going home? Because it's not the right time for them to go home okay. for the purpose for which they were put there. All right. And therefore it's a bigger, it's a bigger, is a monstrous problem that Kenya is facing. And forget about the handshake business. Nothing has been resolved. That is merely a Panadol being prescribed for a cancerous wound. Come 2022, our people will die on these streets. Unless an overhaul of the problems that we have are genuinely resolved. I said we are a dishonest species. Uh, that is the problem. <laughs> Bessie, <laughs> do you read dishonesty in the dragging of the feet um, of the legislative process where the selection panel is concerned? Yes, I, I read mischief because... Uh, like the national uh, majority leader, Duale, he knows that they should have already given a list. It should have been done seven days after they resigned. But because we are dragging feet, there's some bigger, bigger mischievous plan when it comes to the election for 2022 that is being hatched. Their coming back is not just, I mean, it's miscalculated move for them because whoever sits, as he says, somewhere orchestrating the whole plan mis misinterpreted for them what at what time they needed to come back however that said now that we know he has brought in a very key thing that we ask and i will keep asking iebc should have been disbanded immediately rosalind left because she raised issues of integrity nobody talks about that aspect when we have structures and institutions that we are also questioning the integrity as the Kenyan people. Then why should they be in office? Yes, they should have been removed. Now that comes back to the people who have been brought in by the same system that we are calling that lacks integrity to be the members of parliament. Will you call them off? Will you institute, institute uh, measures to get them to get rid of the people who gave you that position? The same thing Dr. has been asking. Will they do it? No. So it is a game of tic-tac. Today we pass on, they are coming back. Tomorrow is another aspect. Oh no, the judge said a different ruling. So we're just playing a limbo here. Okay. Yeah. Um, I want to get to President uh, Uhuru Kenyatta's visit to the U.S. and what could possibly come up in the Oval Office, I imagine if that's where they're meeting, uh, <laughs> with regard to questions on graft and... and uh, <laughs> and electoral justice. Uh, but Felix, first, I want to put this question to you. Um, as a Kenya, as Kenyans, we've talked a lot about culture. We have this culture of Sarekali to Saidiya, Sarekali ni Saidiya. And uh, in Colombia, only yesterday, um, they went to the polls um, on a raft of anti-corruption measures. Uh, their Comptroller General, uh, in a quote in a BBC article, said uh, they're stealing everything. Uh, yes, and that's a gentleman known as Adgardo uh, Maya, and he says uh, corruption is costing their country as much as 15 billion um, US dollars a year. I don't even want to imagine what it costs us. It's been said at a third of our GDP. Um, and part of what they have proposed, or what was proposed, although it didn't go through, was uh, measures including a cut in the wages of the members of Congress, bans on alternative sentences like house arrest for corruption, forcing elect elected officials to publish their tax returns, and a three-term limit on local and national lawmakers. A lot of these measures are already included in our law. Thank you. Why is it not working? What, what can we do as Kenyans? What, what options do we have? Well, it's the personal integrity issues that we keep on dwelling on. And I think uh, Dr. here bluntly uh, and pulled no punches, punches in actually articulating it. And remember, I also made the first observation that that is the gap, if we were to audit the implementation of the Constitution 10 years down the road, that would be one of the gaps. The people that we put in place to manage public offices and public institutions have, 
I have only one thing in mind. What can I get uh, out of it? And the dangers, though, is that because of that, we are routinely and periodically ranked almost lowest. I think we only beat Nigeria, uh, Bangladesh, or Pakistan in the, uh, the uh, Transparency International Anti-Corruption Index. You are rightfully observed that measures that you've articulated that Colombia is thinking of uh, introducing as a result of that referendum are actually in place. Uh, we have uh, leadership and integrity, as I mentioned, uh, the sound constitutional and institutional framework. We have the institutions, different institutions that are intended or are purpose to fight corruption uh, and uh, so on and so forth. The question is, one, the political goodwill, and thank God I still have a lot of faith in this building bridges process. And the renewed energy and impetus by President Uhuru Kenyatta to be able to slay this, uh, I mean, uh, corruption dragon. What we need to do is to sustain the fight. Uh, if you are, uh, and, and I think I hail, I mean, the, the, the new DPP, DCI, and uh, the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission, I think, has been re-energized by these two other entities, but they must uh, pull up the socks. They, we have sound legal and constitutional mechanism in place way ahead of, uh, of, uh, of Colombia. And by the way, just one very quick, quick thing. In February of this year, I attended a, a fellowship in Australia where it was public integrity and combating anti-corruption. And one of the observations that we made in, uh, and we had the privilege of meeting with the key leadership uh, that uh, fight anti-corruption, I mean, fight corruption, judiciary, integrity institutions, etc. And there was a general acknowledgement, both with, by us and also in, by Australian institutions, that Kenya had more progressive laws uh, to fight corruptions. But we did, we, what we lack is the kind of political goodwill and integrity that Australian people and Australian institutions have. But very finally, I think on the issue of uh, IBC, I think it, we also need to acknowledge it. And I say that I took, I didn't have faith in the commission as constituted, and yes, I agree with, her, with you. Following uh, Rosalind's resignation, the commission should have been disbanded. But I think what is also not being effectively communicated, since these three commissioners resigned, and uh, based on the lessons learned in 2007, the chairman of the, uh, the IEBC has actually, albeit slowly, begun putting in reforms that are in is, uh, intended to strengthen this process. And I, I, you know, I had a very candid and honest discussion with him over this issue and uh, faulted some of the decisions that they made in 2017. And I was hoping that with the, again, uh, since the electoral justice is one of those uh, nine pillars that constitute the building bridges, uh, we need an opportunity to uh, walk along those paths, introduce these institutional and legislative reforms, and the reemergence of these two commissioners will be a stumbling block. Uh, part of the reason and a compelling justification for them to stay, step aside. Okay, there's a lot to say on that subject. But I'd like to bring us to President Uhuru Kenyatta's visit to the U.S. Uh, do you think questions, uh, Amnesty International has written to both leaders and raised a number of issues, uh, but do you think issues such as graft and issues such as electoral justice will come up in the meeting? Dr. Olive, you know, b before you even reach there, you ought to have studied uh, the, the, the trend of uh, Donald Trump in terms of matters that affect other countries, which don't affect America. You know, America first is his official policy. Now, throughout the period when we were having our problems here in 2017, can you really identify Donald Trump as having made a consistent and decisive decision to, to adopt a particular policy? If you look at Godek, the ambassador, is he still around? I, ho I hope. Oh, he is. Okay. <laughs> if you look at Godek's uh, participation in all everything that happened, and then when John Kerry came, uh, when he was walking around Bomas with uh, Ezra Chiloba, and uh, very dismissively saying hey, there was a big issues, but everything's okay, and then finally, his hand behind the handshake, which some people think that it was voluntary and it was magnanimous. Do you really expect Donald Trump to bother about the graft in this country? And looking at his personal demeanor as a person, doesn't he have enough of his own personal problems, as far as integrity is concerned, to handle back home? 
In my view, the trip by uh, Honorable Uhuru Kenyatta, which is good, will of course follow the usual etiquette and protocol. We want some trade concessions. We want the AGOA to be strengthened. We want to have direct flights of KQ from here, which is a wonderful thing, by the way. If you have a direct flight from Kenya to Washington or wherever in, in, in the US, is a wonderful thing. Those stopovers are hard, you know, they're back breaking. So yes, we'll talk about trade. AGOA will be an issue. But as far as graft is concerned, which graft? As far as the elections were concerned, what was the problem with the elections? I do not see much light as far as the corruption issue is concerned and as far as the election debacle is concerned. Because for Donald Trump, in my view, reading his body language and how his policies have been articulated, everything's just fine. Okay. We must continue. Bessie, what are your expectations of the meeting between the two leaders? Well, I, I... It's a positive for Kenya that we are being recognized in, in terms of Africa, the entire continent. We are, we are getting audience. Uh, my issue would be the audience that we have sort of been given, what, how are we going to capitalize? You've asked about graft. Um, we've, we have had catalysts, either by them and even us within ourselves being the catalyst for the same graft. So asking Trump to help us on our graft issue, that one, I don't think it will feature anywhere. And maybe you will want to see, because we are the most key strategic partner they have in the entire Eastern Africa. That is to tell Kenyans, we're not just anybody. In East Africa, we have the shots. But if we don't really get our acts together, Rwanda will take over, yeah? so. By the fact that Uhuru is there, he should be able to key in on our position, how strategic we are in this region, and put in things and ask for their help, mainly because he says the big four. They have institutions and companies that would have very good interest here in building the big four, which means better economy, work, and, you know, and all these good things that they would want to do. But it will be very dependent on how the president plays out a strategic position to the U.S. government. On graft, uh, that one will look on another day, maybe not with Trump. Okay. Yeah. Felix, maybe you can weigh in on Kenya's role where the security situation is concerned within the region, because that definitely will come up. Uh, Bessie talks about Kenya being a strategic partner. We've previously, we have troops in Somalia. We've previously had troops in South Sudan. We were very active in the peace negotiations there. But Donald Trump's administration, when he got into office, talked about cutting the peacekeeping budget. Do you think that will come up in the meeting? Well, I think, uh, first of all, by the mere fact that President Uhuru Kenyatta has been invited by Trump, I think it's a big deal. Uh, it is not always that the U.S. Uh, president, and when they talk about U.S., is still the the superpower, uh, the global geopolitics having shifted in the 90s. And so that is a special recognition. And yes, I'm inclined to believe that part of the motivation for this invitation uh, was solely as a result of the strategic uh, importance that Kenya plays in the politics of the sub-region. Uh, the security, uh, Kenya is a stabilizing factor of security situation in Somalia, uh, but also in uh, South Sudan and indeed in the entire region. Whether we have formulated our foreign policy to elevate us to the big brother in the sub-region is a different matter, uh, given the constant, uh, you know, chest thumping of President Museveni, but that's a different matter. And so I, I, I think it's a, it's a big deal, uh, and yes, it's as, a, it's as a result of our strategic importance uh, to the region. And I hope that the pres uh, President Kenyatta is going to use and capitalize on that uh, to be able to negotiate other things beyond our strategic security importance to the United States. Uh, uh, that visit may uh, uh, result in bringing in uh, you know, uh, goodies to strengthen his big four agenda, for example. Uh, and by implication may deal with the issues of uh, that the nine uh, issues uh, are in the building bridges uh, process. But whether the question of electoral integrity or electoral justice will be discussed, I don't think that would come. Why? Because uh, President Trump's own election in 2016 is still mired in controversy. 
there are serious legitimacy and credibility issues that, uh, uh, that uh, tend to that process that led to the Deputy Attorney General of the United State, uh, uh, States, uh, Rod Rosenstein, appointing uh, uh, a grand jury to investigate the, in particular, the involvement and the meddling of Russia in that election. That is the um, Robert Mueller investigation. Uh, Ro yeah, Robert Mueller investigation. Uh, and so what it means is that because to the extent that his own election is mired in controversy, he would be the last person to talk about electoral justice. And uh, there were also issues of uh, uh, integrity surrounding, for example, public disclosure of his tax returns and things like that. And if you look at the indictment so far, both in, the, in New York, uh, the Northern District Court, as it's called in New York, uh, the Robert Mueller investigation itself, uh, uh, but also the investigation that will come up in Virginia. There are issues of financial improprieties that accompanied that process uh, involving uh, Paul Manafort and involving now uh, his former uh, Cohen. attorney, uh, Cohen. So I don't think issues of electoral justice or integrity will be discussed, but it, uh, it is a unique opportunity for the president to seize on that opportunity. And I wonder, probably, uh, I think uh, maybe two or three presidents uh, in Af from Africa have been able to meet the US president since 2016. Okay. Yeah. Um, Daktari, uh, at the end of this month, we expect another world leader, and that is Theresa May, who will be hosted um, in Nairobi. Why now? <laughs> why, why Kenya and why now? Good question. Uh, maybe that's a question that uh, your colleague uh, Kanza Dena would be uh, very competent to answer why now and why not before. Uh, for, for me, I, I think that uh, what the president is doing, uh, having stabilized his seat. Because remember, until recently, until March 9th, the president was regarded as an illegitimate president. And uh, he had big challenge even facing his outside counterparts on the very basis that his election was challenged, and not just challenged, but severely challenged, and that for the first time, I think the only one in the world, there was another president uh, named the People's President. Now, once this stabilized, it is in the interest of uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta that he reaches out to his international colleagues to be able to get, number one, the international legitimacy that comes with it, and number two, to be able to access the opportunities of mutual assistance that arises from that kind of relationship. Now, Theresa May, if you recall, she also has had quite a bit of trouble uh, back home because this was the architect of the Brexit. And... Uh, even, even though the, the vote was ruled in favor of Brexit, she's having a lot of teething problems. And key among them is her acceptability of the trading terms in the former European Union. So she's also out there looking for possible markets for her own goods and possible trade partners. Now, Kenya, obviously, being the hub of the East, East Central and really Southern African region, becomes very strategic in terms of if you access Kenyan markets, by extension, you can access the larger East African, Central African market. So it is a mutual symbiotic relationship that the two are seeking to achieve, in my view. Why now? It might have been earlier, but how could it have been earlier when there were two presidents? Now there's one president, and therefore he rightfully goes out to look for friends. That's my take. Okay. Bessie, I, I take it you agree and that at least with Theresa May, she has some moral authority to discuss issues of electoral reform and graft. Okay. Well, the why now is that Kenya is well positioned. We are getting a, a grip of what we need to do as Kenyans before he first comes to president. And reason being is also, I think we they want also to curtail the eastern powers that are have found so much interest in being in our country because China is really taking over Africa. So if they don't do something, the powers will shift. So their why now is more of we are losing our key clientele. We've, we've lost ground because we're either being too much in their business, saying we have to fight corruption, you have to do this. They're giving us the carrot and stick kind of relationship now they've seen there's someone else who doesn't care whether you're doing your carrot and stick called china we are willing to do this for the extent of this so they want to remove the china aspect being the dominant person in kenya so for why now i think is more on their part to benefit again um 
it also shows you how important Kenya is. I mean, we, they can't go anywhere without us. They also need their British army uh, extents, uh, being in our country in Anyuki more. Yeah? <coughs> so I mean, it's just a way of being diplomatic, but they have a hidden agenda. I always say there's no way you would leave your well-civilized society to come here and you know, make friends if there is no ulterior motive to it. So there's something they're going to benefit by her coming. Okay. Felix, I will ask you, is there an aspect of China in, <laughs> in, in these meetings? Because there's a forum for Africa that is coming up um, where China is concerned. Um, what, what do we expect to come out of that? Because people have said Kenya needs to renegotiate, for example, our debt burden, what we owe China. Um, of course, we're extending the SGR. There are a lot of implications where, where that is concerned. Could uh, the US and the UK also be looking for a piece of that cake? Absolutely, and that has defined global politics from time immemorial. The emergence of China as a global economic superpower and its monopoly of businesses, not just in Kenya, but pretty much in Africa and the rest of the world, is a major uh, source of concern for the West. Uh, and its ability to be able to, uh, yeah, with very limited co little conditions, to be able to uh, get in and do business and do transactions and things like that has been a major concern. And so it is not far-fetched to make a conclusion. And if you look at the machinations and the attempts by, bo by especially the Western countries, moderating uh, Chinese influence has been a major factor in their new foreign policy. And yes, I won't put that past it, uh, past America and the UK, uh, and don't forget, UK was, is our colonial master. And so I won't put that past them. And yeah, but uh, again, the second limb to that question was the skyrocketing, uh, I mean, the unhealthy uh, debt relationship that we have with China. I think if left unchecked, uh, I think it's going to spell uh, very serious challenges to this country. And I think uh, it is time has come when we must evaluate not just the debt burden, but also uh, evaluate what we put these debt resources to. Uh, remember, there are unresolved issues surrounding the first euro bond. There are unresolved issues surrounding a massive loan to China, including the SDR that you pointed out. For a longer distance and for a better and a more and a late and a more progressive technology, Ethiopia is making uh, is and for by but for with less money. Uh, Ethiopia has been able to build a better SGR than we have, and, and so on and so forth. So I think uh, the, 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 the skyrocketing debt burden uh, is something that really needs to be checked. Okay. Yeah. We've spoken a lot about allegiances here. Of course, we've talked about IBC commissioners, allegiances to those who appointed them, parliamentarians, allegiances to those who made their, uh, their office holding possible. But there's also the saying that he who pays the piper calls a tune. Where that is concerned as far as Ken the Kenya-China relationship is concerned, is it something we should be worried about, Dr. Tari? Of course we should. I think uh, Felix is just appointed to it. Uh, personally, as a, as, as a public uh, sensitive citizen, I'm concerned at the rate of our consumption of Chinese debt. But more of concern is the cost of that debt. If you read Dr. David Ndee's tweets, you'll, have, you, you'll, you'll be amazed. That guy, people seem to be ignoring because of his political affiliation, but that guy is laying bare the economic trouble that we are getting in as far as SGR is concerned. Now, Felix has also pointed out when he says that the Ethiopians have been able to do an SGR which is better at less the amount and then comes in who we are. So we go to China, negotiate for a big project, but in there, there are embedded our cuts. So the cost of the SGR is escalated, not because the Chinese loan is expensive, but because our cuts are expensive. And because we are the people who determine whether the Chinese will get the contracts or not, the Chinese have no problem. They just put it up. After all, the burden is on your back and my back and my back, not the Chinese. So yes, there is a concern that the Chinese debt is becoming impossible. Indeed, the entire public debt is, has burst the limits. 
And only what is more upsetting is that the people put in charge, I remember the governor of Central Bank and I think Rotich this year saying that don't worry, our debt is manageable. Hardly one year down the road, they are saying they are now seeking foreign experts to manage, to manage our debt. And something more that Kenyans are not being told as much is that the IMF actually is in the process of putting Kenya under receivership. Similar to what Chase Bank went through, similar to what Imperial Bank went through. But nobody's saying it. Nobody's saying it loudly. We must question the consumption of the public debt in this country. And for information, most of these loans were procured illegally because they, were, they did not go through the parliamentary approval which requires that for any loan to be obtained, foreign loan, the parliament must approve. Olive, today, if you look at the price of petrol in Kenya and compare with Uganda, I do not know the latest now, but the practice has been that we are more priced in terms of petrol than Uganda. Yet the petrol arrives in Mombasa, goes all through Malaba. So how then can our petroleum products be more expensive? Again, the top-ups. Look at the electricity. Transformers were brought, which malfunctioned. If today you buy uh, tokens worth 700 shillings, what you actually get is 468. The rest, you've paid levies. All this is because of the Chinese debt and other debts, not only Chinese, but Chinese tops the list. So yes, my answer is we are concerned about the consumption of debt in this country. And that's why I said from the beginning of this show that we are concentrating on issues you should not be concentrating on. What we'll be concentrating on is to ask ourselves, what is the state of our economy? Indeed, if it was in other countries which are more self-respecting, which have citizens who are not gullible and docile, there will be a peaceful revolution in this country. We'll be asking President Uhuru Kenyatta, why have you destroyed our lives? Because the economy is in shambles. But nobody's talking about it. Because the deep state, again, dictates what the agenda of the nation will be. So now you're talking about corruption and corruption. NTV is concentrating on corruption scandal after the other. You are not highlighting the fact that IMF is putting us under receivership. Yet, when you walk across the street and go to Naivas, you'll feel the pinch. Since when did VAT apply to, pet to petrol in this country? There's a crisis, but nobody talks about it because we are not in control of our lives. Our lives are controlled by the deep state. All but right, we come back to that deep state because I still want to start winding down this conversation. <laughs> Bessie, what, I mean, what's our role as me and you who are sitting here and the person who's watching and listening? What is our role in this fight, in this war against graft? The first thing is we have to stop being gullible and we also have to stop being docile. We must take an active role to ask and question the people who have been put in these positions. I remember Dr. Terry said once that we need to go back to those house arrests. When people have started stealing, and you know it is me who is stealing, arrest me from there. We, we have to take an active role. This is the part where we have put institutions, people no, don't want to run them. We have people who, we have laws, perfect laws, but there is no day some, until there is an agitation from the, the public itself that we can't go on this way, then it stops. Now, when he's talked about the fuel uh, VAT, we had people clamoring, we want to have a strike with the motorists, we are not going to do all these things we want to do, striking, striking, striking. But nothing has happened, yes? But the people who sit at Treasury know you will make noise for today, tomorrow you will keep quiet and move on. Same with the electricity. I said, and I'll still say it, the people in the ERC Commission, those people should be actually charged. You have been stealing from Kenyans. Whether you're complacent in it or not, you have. Because it's something very personal. You are paying for 800 shillings. I didn't steal that money. I have earned my money, honestly. And I, when I pay for those tokens, I expect the same money. But they will put their levies. They will continue putting. But with whose authority? The Commission's authority. We have commissions that are duplicate. We duplicate the rules, and that comes again, the public wage. So who is going to bear this burden and say enough is enough? It is, we have to take a very keen and active role in how we are dispensing our money, what we are doing, the people who are put in these positions. That for me, that's how we, we will fight craft. We have to take an active role.
Okay, um, Felix, I'll bring you, I want to start winding down the conversation, but today uh, the Immigration Department opened a hotline, 0745660151, for reporting illegal immigrants in the crackdown ordered by the Interior CS Matiangi. It's not the first time we've been given numbers and hotlines to use. We had a portal you can use to report graft. Uh, Matiangi and his PS, Kibicho, said, you know, you can tweet us, uh, these are our accounts, uh, Sonko says, call me between 5 in the morning and I don't know what time and report these incidences. Do Kenyans actually take advantage of these mechanisms or is there a reason why either people don't buy into the idea? No, we don't take that seriously. In fact, it's one amongst the many uh, efforts uh, and machinations. And uh, by the way, uh, if you are there answering to that call, the other side of the immigration department, uh, all manner of funny phone calls and reports and uh, fictitious and fake reports will come. I mean, the immigration uh, department uh, uh, should up its game in terms of, uh, you know, being innovative in fighting, I mean, uh, dealing with illegal immigration. Having said that, although, by the way, I think the interior minister's hardline position on cracking down on that uh, is something that if it is done judicially uh, following the due process uh, and to the extent that there are potentially uh, opportunities that are for Kenyans that are being taken, I'm told they are in certain instances they are Chinese orcas in the streets. Uh, you know, these are things, uh, these are expertise that Kenyans uh, can do. Uh, if it's done judicially and uh, done following the due process, uh, it's something that I support. But the f bottom line is that in all these efforts, and going back to your question as I wind up, uh, is the fact or our inability to deal with the deep state and state capture in the fight against corruption. By definition, and Dr. here is the professor, he can correct that. Deep state is that informal, shadowy entities and characters that have fundamental influence over the mainstream state uh, and who are responsible for so many illicit things and many bad things that are happening in the state. And uh, that usually happen, I mean, uh, go hand in hand with the state capture. Be it electoral process, the extent of state capture of IABC, the extent of shadowy elements and characters that influence decision making at whatever level is a major factor that, and a major contributing factor to corruption and indeed ills that afflict governance uh, and inhibit and militate against the realization of the spirits of the 2010 constitution. Other countries have been very proactive in dealing with the deep state and state capture. As we speak, the South African Cons uh, Constitutional Court directed President Cyril Ramaphosa to in a, a, appoint a judicial inquiry into the deep, deep state and state capture, influence peddling, etc., under Jacob Zuma's administration. This is how countries deal with it. In other words, we must, uh, to deal with corruption, it calls for personal integrity that we are lacking, but also the proactiveness of the state to crack down on the deep state and state capture. Okay, and we end the conversation there. Unfortunately, we have to end the conversation there. But thank you very much, Dr. Terry. Thank you very much, Bessie. Thank you very much, Felix. Um, I hope we get an opportunity to continue this conversation further, and I appreciate your input. There you have it, uh, the deep state, at least I've learned. <laughs> <laughs> of the term today. Um, from the deep state, I think we need something to lighten the mood a bit. Over to you, Usha, with the entertainment. Right, Olive, there is no better way to start the entertainment brief, brief than, of course, um, giving you something funny, something to laugh about and make your Monday, well, less blue. Of course, I am talking about the meme of the day. Take a look.
you have to admit that looks a lot like Daisy, like it's not even hating or anything. But moving on, of course, um, we know that Lil Wayne and Batman have been having before the longest time ever and it has been upsetting fans. It broke all fans' hearts you know, when they didn't make up and we resigned ourselves to the faith that probably they, they would never make up, you know, that this was it. But um, yesterday, actually, Batman, uh, not yesterday, over the weekend, Batman actually publicly apologized at a Lil Louisiana concert and uh, the two will be watching. I think that's what happens also with the Big Bang. But that is it for the entertainment brief. Of course, we would like to hear your feedback. If you have new memes, if you have new music, anything that you would like us to put here, hashtag entertainment brief, that is how you can get to us. Uh, back to you, Olive. Thank you, Usha. End of an era there with the Big Bang Theory ending. Is it season 12? It's season 12. That's going to be the last season. 
Hard All right, drinking. and uh, that's it for this segment of NTV Today. I'll come back in a few minutes with the 1 p.m. news. If you've just joined us, you're watching NTV Today. My name is Olive Burrows and here are the 1 p.m. stories. Three people were this morning killed in a grisly road accident in Kisumu after a passenger van they were traveling in overturned and rolled after its brakes failed. Four passengers, among them a two-year-old child, sustained serious injuries and are currently being treated at the Jaramogi Oginga Odinga Teaching and Referral Hospital, where doctors have described their condition as critical. Survivors told NTV that the driver appeared to have lost control of the vehicle when it started swerving from one side of the road to the other before landing in a ditch. The Matatu was going down Riyat Hills on the Kisumu Kakamega Highway when the accident occurred. The driver of the ill-fated van is among those fighting for their lives at the hospital and most of the passengers were traders and people on their way to work.
Ukifika ukweli ika lose break ika fail tukaona tu gari inaanza kumisbiewa tumepita kwa namba ya roundabout na i think uh, ilikuwa kwa speed na we, we, when we were approaching a uh, coptic uh, roundabout it rolled vile ilitoka kiboswa kama ilikuwa town ilikosa break sasa ilikuwa kwa speed sana ambapo ilifika kwa roundabout sasa hii ingeweza kata kona ili ikagonga pavement ya roundabout na ikaenda ikaruka kichwa kagonga chini ndio kaanza kupelengika mpaka pale penye idilala nakushukuru serikali ya Kisumu ama county government wamejaribu waka sustain ukiangalia respond yao ilikuwa mzuri na wamejaribu sana 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 quick respond wamekuwa nayo so naweza omba government sana sana ya county government watusaidie na madaktari ile wawe wengi jambo kama hili likitokezea wawe kwa waki respond kwa haraka on to matters at the Independent and Electoral Boundaries Commission. IBC Chairperson Wafula Chabukati has said that the resignation of three of the commissioners stands and that the commission will not allow them back to serve. This comes three days after two of the commissioners, namely Margaret Mwachanya and Connie Minor, reported to work citing a high court ruling that said their resignation did not follow the due process and that they are by law still considered commissioners of the Electoral and Boundaries Commission. Paul Kurgat, the third commissioner who had resigned Designed alongside Mwachanya and Minor is yet to report to the commission. Shabukati says that the commission will expect the president to name new appointees to replace the three. IBC does not have offices for former commissioners. You cannot come here and say I'm a former commissioner, give me space to work from here. And so as far as we are concerned, they are not supposed to be working here. And this has to be made very, very clear to the country that there's no place for former commissioners in the IEBC. So mine is to say that they came on Friday and uh, we were surprised to learn that they had retained some of the keys which they had not handed over and accessed their offices. But that has now been rectified and uh, today they came back to see me but we had prearranged meetings, meetings which are for activities of the commission and those meetings are ongoing up to now so i didn't manage to see them but i asked them to go and put in writing what they want to see me about and if and when they do so then we shall address the issues which they may want to deal with immediately they resigned i wrote to the treasury the ps to stop their salaries uh, now i am not certain whether that was done up to now, I've not got a feedback on my letter, but I believe that uh, uh, Treasury acted on the, the recommendations from the Commission that they are no longer in office and I hope they are not being paid. The county government of West Pokot will back eradication of retrogressive practices that affect the girl child and is gearing to empower the girl through education. Speaking yesterday during a three-day mentorship program organized by report organization at Chester Girls Primary School, West Pokot County, Governor John Lonyangapur stated that the program was yielding fruit and many girls have benefited. The mentorship program, spearheaded by the county's first lady, Mary Lonyangapur, has helped girls acquire life skills to navigate the transition from childhood to adolescence, overcome negative peer pressure, avoid risky sexual behavior, prevent many girls from the cut and forced marriages, as well as empower them to get education. CEC Finance, Kitalawian, Director Molo, Honorable MCS, Olomut, Nanamu. Kilifi South MP Ken Chonga wants authorities to ban night festivities, 
popularly known as Disco Matangas, to curb immorality. The MP wants the ban enforced, citing negative effects of the night festivities as students' performance in schools has gone down. Speaking in a meet meeting in Chonyi, Chonga termed it as the major contributor to early pregnancies and early marriages in the region. This comes in the wake of several cases of teenage pregnancies, with the MP saying 17 schoolgirls became pregnant in the past few months and that all the incidents were blamed on the Disco Matanga phenomenon. Watoto wetu ambao wako shule za msingi. Kasi ile wanapata mimba ni kasi ya kuogofia. Saizi ninaelezea kwamba mahali kama Mbuyu ni primary school. Tuko na watoto saba wako na mimba. Vevesi primary school. Kuna watoto watano. Nimeambiwa Kolongoni iko na watoto watano. Ni katika zile takwimu ambazo sahizi niko nazo. Na si ajabu ya kwamba kwenye mashule mengine hili janga limekidhiri. Kusema ukweli kabisa wacha tusifiwe na mazuri yote. Lakini ni aibu kusifiwa kwa idadi ya watoto wachanga wanaoingia mimba. We'd like to get your thoughts on what the MP describes as disco matangas. Did you go to any when you were growing up? And did, ha did it have a negative impact on how your life turned out? You can tweet us, Facebook us, or even Instagram us on NTV Kenya. And uh, now we go to the county government of... Uh, Taita Taveta County, where residents have complained about low income reaching locals engaged in the mining sector owing to manipulation of the market by external investors. Speaking in a mining awareness forum organized by the county in conjunction with Ahadi Kenya, the residents say miners in the area do not earn enough to cater for their families. The public awareness forum targeted residents living around mining sites like Kamtonga, Njukini, Kasigahu and Kishushe. This is meant to help both investors, the government and the public benefit from the natural resources. The government has been urged to appoint representatives to ensure revenue collected from mining departments is equally distributed. The deputy governor of Taita Tabeta, that is Majala Mlagui, has promised the public that all their views will be taken into consideration. Na, 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 na county ambaye anaweza kutoa ripoti za kazi vile inaendelea pale lakini kama itakuwa ni, ni, mwen, ni mchimbaji ambaye ni mwenye mgodi hawezi kutoa ukweli wake wote tumeona kwamba kuna appetite kubwa sana ya jamii kutaka kujishulisha na mambo ya uchimbaji wa madini lakini shida ni upungufu wa kuju, kujua mambo ya sheria na kujua ni wapi wanaweza pata fedha ama capital ambaye itawasaidia kufanya hizi kazi ya uchimbaji wa madini. Waro the Kiru comes up with the latest from the sporting world. Yes, so it is time to get sporty on NTV at 1. I'm Warote Kiru, and uh, we'll be catching up with Brian Otwal, who is in Parliament, uh, just finding out uh, what's going on as a permanent secretary for sports. Uh, that's uh, Ambassador Kerimi Kaberia gets grilled by the Public Accounts Committee regarding the audit queries for the World Under-18 Championships. But before that, in Kenya Hockey Union Men's Premier League action, Butali Sugar Warriors school KCA University 5-1, while Green Sharks defeated Strathmore University Gladiators 3-1 at City Park. In a peak of the lower league results on Sunday, Park Road Tigers beat Gorilla 2-1 and Park Road Budges pipped Parklands 1-0 in the men's, while in the ladies, Multimedia drew 1-1 with Wolverines. With the win, Butali, who are former champions, took a three-point lead at the top of the men Hockey Premier League, while well, Green Sharks consolidated their third place in the league. Men's defending champions, Kenya Police, who are not in action, stay second. And uh, let's uh, wear uh, running shoes and uh, the 13th edition of the Safari Madoka Half Marathon that will be held on Mashuja Day this year will seek to increase participation from foreign athletes in a bid to raise the standards of the competition. The fund of the race, held in Gerani, Taita Taveta County, retired Major Mazden Madoka, has spoken of his quest to maximize on the altitude in Taita Hills to boost Kenyan athletics. The idea was I wanted to uplift the standards there. 
having been a sportsman myself, if you know I was uh, more involved in boxing and actually people wondered why I took athletics and, uh, instead of boxing simply because there was more um, exposure and uh, money in athletics than boxing. When we look at Taita Hills, where we normally do the mar marathon, it's the same altitude as Eldoret, mm -hmm. you see. In fact, that's why I was starting the event there, to try and tap the talent from the hills and also encourage the lower coast people to come and so we can get some people from the coast, an opportunity to get international athletes. We are hoping that maybe we'll be able to get a world champion from that region because I'm saying there's that at altitude. And uh, we wait to see how that pans out. And Real Madrid are not missing Cristiano Ronaldo as they keep on winning in La Liga. This is Inter Milan's stuttering start in Sierra A continues and Borussia Dortmund got their Bundesliga campaign off to a winning start. Details in the International Football Roundup. Real Madrid cruised on. in regards to the world under 18 uh, audit queries by the Auditor General and Otual, maybe just give us an update of how the morning has been like uh, for you and for Ambassador Kaberia. Well, Warote, it hasn't been easy for one Ambassador uh, Pierre, who is also the PS, that is Ambassador Kirimi Kaberia, to explain uh, uh, the amount of money given to the Ministry of Sports uh, to spend for the world under 18 in terms of making it a success. We were successful in bagging the medals, but a success that was not achieved in terms of ensuring that the money was spent well. And the government had given them 3.5 million shillings, or rather 3.5 billion shillings, but then 1.7 billion shillings 
was given to the sports ministry specifically with 800 million shillings given to Kenyatta University and another 1 billion shillings given to Sports Kenya and separately these three entities will be uh, grilled differently and it has started with the Ministry of Sports who had been given 1.7 billion shillings that is from the 3.5 billion shillings and 800 billion shillings that well, or rather 800 million shillings that will be accounted for by the Kenyatta University later on and Sports Kenya to account for the other 1 billion shillings and Ambassador Karimi Kaberia who uh, had his time or rather I would still going on right now to explain that amount of money how he spent it and queries have arisen from the amount of money that has been spent looking at it uh, amount of uh, uh, different amounts uh, an example being f uh, from the procurement of transport as well uh, and cleaning services questions coming uh, from that uh, asking why is it that uh, some companies uh, had been given uh, the tenders of, uh, after it was a single entity or rather single solicited or single source rather to uh, give the, the tenders for the services to the world under 18. An example being the paying cabs who gave transport as well and uh, paying laundries giving another services under the same directors with the same name but difference in terms of uh, the name of paying cabs and paying laundries giving the same services rather for the world and 18 also explaining that and was required to give an explanation as to why the amount of money given to them was so much as per the, uh, the market rates that are in the country so far also some amount of money that were lost in other uh, entities in terms of uh, giving at other services also if we can look an example being that uh, why is it that uh, there were hotels that were there and giving an example Sarova and Sarova Stanley as well as Safari Park two hotels five star hotels giving the same services at the same time also to explain but then at the same time the, the athletes who were sleeping at Kenyatta University that were being funded under Kenyatta University budget how is it that it was paid for by sports ministry also something that he it, uh, tried to shed light on but was not clear asking to be given more time to come out with more information on the same so a lot uh, to be given or rather a lot of clearance he is supposed to give out and clear information not coming out from the same but the investigation is still going on with PAC that is the public accounts committee uh, of parliament is uh, grilling him uh, now for more than uh, three hours from that uh, starting at 10 a.m and just to explain how that money went uh, to be spent and the amount given was 3.5 billion shillings 1.7 billion shillings to the ministry of sports that is yet to be ensured or rather recovered how it was spent and 800 million shillings to kenyatta university and 1 billion to sports kenya that will Will be illustrated later as i'll be explaining that in our subsequent bulletins but for now i hand i go back uh, to that uh, committee as it is still going on back to you Warate. uh Otwal, uh before we let you go uh, maybe uh, you've talked about it's been three hours of grilling uh, for ambassador kaberia what is the tone like in the room uh, how is he handling the pressure how is he handling the spotlight and uh, has he been able to give uh, coherent answers to the questions being asked uh, about the auditor queries it has not been easy for him being that the questions are coming in thick and fast, some uh, that he is not even aware of. Remember, he came into this sometime in April, that is in April 2017, just three months to the event in July 2017. And the previous PS who was there had so much information about that. And the LOC, actually, the former PS who was there is the one who, that is, um, um, sorry, PS Ekai, who organized the LOC before the current PS came in at, uh, that is in April 2017 so he has little information about how the LOC was formed how the budget uh, came came to place and how the money was allocated differently but he has tried to explain that and he has also asked for more inf rather for more time to explain that but he has not been uh, very clear of how it has been spent and he seeks to uh, come out clear on the same but later on he will explain as to why that amount of money was not clearly spent depending on how the solid uh, or rather the auditor general comes out clear saying that some amount of money was allocated here and here but they were not spent as per the program and uh Otwell, Otwell, lastly uh the it is uh, just a few minutes after one o'clock is the committee set to break for lunch or will they continue their grilling until uh, they're done with uh, the ambassador 
The chairman of the PSC has not mentioned anything about uh, breaking, uh, but uh, currently they are going on. No t signs of breaking for, uh, for a minute, but uh, if that happens, well and good for uh, PS uh, Kaberia, but currently it's still going on. More information he's yet to give out. Okay, and uh, that was uh, Brian Utwala just giving us an update of uh, what's going on at uh, Parliament Buildings where the Sports Permanent Secretary, that's uh, Ambassador Karimi Kaberia, is being grilled by the Public Accounts Committee in regards to the spending of the money allocated to the Sports Ministry for the World Under-18 Championships, uh, which uh, was a huge success on the track, but a lot of audit queries have been raised uh, regarding the same by the Auditor General, and uh, we will be following up with that. Uh, Brian Utwala will be giving us uh, the update of that in our Subsequent bulletins. Also remember the county assembly games are kicking off at Kasarani currently and also the Africa Under-20 Volleyball Championship. Uh, Yushua Makori is uh, keeping tabs on that and we'll be giving you updates on that uh, later on. But for now, back to you, Olive. Warode, thank you very much. Warode there with the latest from the sports world. Children in Kilifi County. Children in Kilifi County are yet to join some early childhood education centers due to stalled classrooms which were allocated funds from the 2013-14 financial year. Meanwhile, in Kajiado County, 700 ECDE teachers are undergoing a, a one-week free training in a bid to improve the level of quality of education in the county. These classes are meant to be operating as early childhood development centers in Kilifi County. But the project stalled due to lack of funds, forcing a number of children to remain at home as they could not cover long distances to other ECDE centers. CDs are there for bats and goats to live. Yeah. <laughs> Yet in Wawesa Ward, Mikahani, eh, Hakuna are there are no ECD. These ECDs were budgeted for since 2013 to date. Mm. We don't have ECDs in Mikahani. Mm. Please help us. But now construction has resumed for 128 classrooms after the county's budget committee agreed to allocate more funds as well as recruit 28 contractors for the job. It is expected that the construction will be complete by end of September. The county's leadership was at Kizingo Primary School in Chonyi sub-county, where they distributed stationery for ECD pupils in the region. By April this year, only 193 ECD centers out of 345 centers in the county were complete. Meanwhile, in Kajado County, 700 ECDE teachers are undergoing training at the National Industrial Training Authority in Athi River in a bid to improve learning outcomes in the county. The teachers have been oriented on the new curriculum as well as trained on how to introduce formal education to their pupils. We have Carol, Caroline Jambi. <laughs> Pia watoto wadogo wanakuja shuleni wakuwa na njaa na mara nyingi shule zingine hazina madarasa walimu tunafundishia chini ya mti. The most important person we want to take care of ni mtoto wetu. Sani kweli? Yes. That is why the governor wants to improve your environment. Embarrassingly, we are a D county on average for our form 4 children. But because of what? Because we've been building our house from the roof. We have now completed a survey or a study on how to take that forward. But there's nothing more important in that mission than putting the foundation right. The training program has been sponsored by the county government and Kenya Literature Bureau. They're also planning on distributing learning materials worth 100 million shillings at the beginning of third term. Sharon Baranga, NTV. Kajado and not Kilifi County there. We end our NTV at one with that report from Sharon Baranga. Coming up is NTV Sasa with Salim Swale who will be bringing us the latest from the IEBC where Commissioners Margaret Wachanya and Commissioner Constant uh, Consolata Minor were earlier today and the chairman of the IEBC that is Wafula Chebukati declined to see them asking them to instead write to him formally. That's it from me. My name is Olive Barrows. Keep it on TV.